Yeah, dear friends and dear colleagues here in the, in the room and dear friends and colleagues in the space, welcome back after the break. It's wonderful to have you and it's wonderful to have Jacob in his, in his panel. I think one of the reasons, please close the door, keep the doors because we want the energy in this room. <laughs> um, <and not. laughs> so I think one of the reasons why Jacob chose the topic of venture capital may be that, that his son is actually a venture capitalist and he's helping his son and he also, I think, was on the board of another venture capital. So I think he is a, he is a spirited man in this and he has all, everything for, for this panel. He's also a great partner in my law firm. He, he joined um, two years ago um, heading the, the, the department government relations and lobbying and we currently have a mission for Central Asia. So we, he's doing a lot of things and I would like to give the floor to, to you, Jacob. Please introduce your channel and uh, your panel and <laughs> thank you very much. And <laughs> start. Get started. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Alexander. That's very kind uh, from you. But I really don't want to be at the center, having such a wonderful, uh, wonderful set of, of speakers here on the panel. And yes, um, it's not just the startups that I'm. It's not just that I'm also an investor into a startup and uh, it's, it's running in the family. It's not just that. It's also that as an economist. Um, startups, young, uh, uh, young, uh, rapidly growing uh, firms, companies are extremely important. Actually, in the U.S., one more than 100% of the of the jobs are net are created by by young and rapidly growing uh, firms. Um, they push innovation, uh, they multiply innovation, they create the jobs of the future. Future, so they have a, a, actually a, a big economic value. Um, even if they are, if you look at the, uh, the, the big technology firms today, they're all VC financed, uh, VC financed startups, uh, Google, Amazon, uh, you name it. So this is a huge, and this, this is a huge push of innovation that, that drives growth. So there's an economic reason to, uh, to invest, to actually as a country, to have a, a startup scene that is very active. Now, startups and VC capital today is actually very much on vogue. And actually, I would argue, we can discuss that later on, Switzerland is a startup nation. Uh, but one of the things that you're reading about uh, now is uh, that financing can be a bit of a challenge for, for uh, especially in the, in the scale-up scale up phase, uh, phase of a startup. And at the same time, we have um, the huge monies that are invested, well, um, basically the majority of it is, is, is invested differently. We have one billion, uh, billion Swiss francs. We have one trillion Swiss francs in the pension funds. And those funds are invested uh, mostly in uh, a fixed income, in, in uh, real estate, and the rest uh, is, is in stocks. As a country, then, you also have to wonder, well, if uh, such a huge uh, part of um, capital that is actually compulsory saving uh, isn't invested in something that is really creating economic value for the, 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 the future, then you wonder, okay, would this be an asset class for them? Why, what is the problem? And basically, this is where um, I ask now, we asked, uh, the Swiss, uh, future, uh, Swiss Future Fund uh, to make a presentation, and, and uh, that's where actually the Swiss Future Fund thought, okay, this, we have 1,500 pension funds. Investing into startups is complex. It's, it's really different from investing differently. You can't expect from, or let's say it's quite difficult that not every, quite certainly, not every of those 1,500 pension funds can have a VC a department doing that it will be impossible. So the idea is of the Swiss Future uh, Fund is to do it for them, run it for them, and uh, give them the opportunity to invest. Now, I'm going to stop here. This is just about the idea, and I'm going to introduce uh, the people that I have on my, my panel. We have Domenico Scala. 
He is the president of the Swiss uh, Future Fund uh, Foundation. He is a chairman of so many companies that I'm hesitating to uh, uh, mention <laughs> them all, but, but it's uh, companies and organizations, the uh, Innovation Park Basel area, Oettinger Davidoff, uh, uh, Basilea Pharmaceutica, uh, Basel area Swiss, Bach Basel, economic, uh, um, economics, which does economic studies, and to studies, and he's a former CEO of Bio Noble Care, and he previously held a very senior positions at Syngenta and Roche. He's an economist from Basel. Then we have Andreas Göldi, who is right here. He's a partner at uh, B2V, a European venture capital firm managing about uh, 510 million euro of funds. Andreas is a serial entrepreneur, so he knows both both uh, sides of the of this industry. Uh, startups and uh, and the investing as well, and he has more than 25 years of experience in this space. He joined uh, B2B uh, in 2019 as a partner, and he co-founded and helped build several successful technology startups in both Europe and the United States. And he holds a master degree in technology management from MIT and the University of St. Gallen, as well as several U.S. patents. Then we have Evelyn Pflugi, who is actually right next here. She is um, the chief investment, uh, excuse me, that's the other person. She is the CEO <laughs> and the co-founder of the Singularity Group, mm -hmm. an asset manager uh, that concentrates on applied innovation. She previously was a uh, portfolio manager of Energy Fund and an active manager of various mandates in natural resources at GAM Investment Management in Zurich. Evelyn holds a degree in engineering from ETH, which is one of the top 10 universities in the world, and, and has specialized on biotechnology and food, I think. Yep. Right. So, Matthias Ramser, uh, next person here, he's the chef, chief investment officer of Reichmut, private bankers. He provides, uh, in, among his job description, is also providing asset management portfolio management for pension funds. So he, uh, he'll be able to say, uh, talk to us about that. He was previously head of portfolio management of SUVA, which is the Swiss accident insurance, um, a company under public law. Um, before that, he held several roles at Julius Baer, Zurich uh, Cantal Bank, and HSBC. He held, holds a PhD in economics from, the, from Zurich University. Then we have Valti. Uh, comes from us from the Federal Assembly. He is the group president of the Liberals uh, in the National Council. Um, so he's a very important person. He's going to tell us, uh, well, this is always political, right? Startups are political, pension funds are political. So it's great to have him here. He's a, um, a partner at uh, Wenger Wieli and he advises on matters of commercial and corporate law and governance issues. And uh, he is also an active board member uh, and trustee in several organizations. So that is my, um, my panel, and uh, I'm very proud to have such a qualified panel. I think now we can go on and give uh, Domenico Scala the floor to see what his uh, proposal is for, uh, for uh, financing uh, startups. Thank you, and thank you for taking some of my thunders away at the introduction. Oh, I'm sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, no worries, I have some more. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, um, thank you for having me here. I am from industry, so this is quite an unusual audience for me to talk to. Um, the key word on this slide is real economy. <laughs> After having heard uh, about blockchain and definance, I think venture capital is pretty easy. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, 1835, 1835, John Boeing, member of the English Parliament, visited Switzerland. Why did he visit Switzerland? He was sent to look after these Swiss that were competing against the British textile industry all over the world, and they couldn't figure out why that was the case. In fact, 
up to 1770, the Swiss were quite a power play in the silk and textiles industries. And with the advent of the Industrial Revolution, um, Switzerland dramatically lost uh, in the world ranking. One could also say it became quite poor because it had completely missed out the um, transformation and the Industrial Revolutions. But by 1805, Escher Wies created the first manufacturing plant here in Zürich, actually, to introduce textiles in a, in a machinated way. And by 1835, when John Boeing came to visit Switzerland, Switzerland was at the forefront of electrification, of industrialization, and it was already a net exporter. And the subsequent decades formed the basis of what we have today. Um, most of, if not all, our industry icons of today have been created in the late 19th century. Even the banking industry in Switzerland has been created in the 19th century. And we are still here in Switzerland benefiting from this cycle of enormous innovation of the 19th century. And the foundation which I'm chairing is absolutely convinced that we must, in Switzerland, substantially increase our investments in venture capital, in real economy, in order to ensure the wealth we have created in this country for the next generations to come. The Swiss um, Foundation, Swiss Future Fund Foundation is not a foundation, or we don't do the fund management ourselves. We are promoting an idea, and the idea is that we have enormous funds or collective savings in Switzerland, and we should divert a significant part, a much more significant part, of that investments into the investments in the real economy through venture capital. We have uh, supported the Grabo mo uh, motion in the parliament, which has led also to a new asset class, uh, alternative classes, which is also called venture fund. Now, this is the idea behind the foundation. But, you know, convincing people to invest in venture fund for economic reason or altruistic reason is not sufficient. Uh, investments in venture fund has to pay off. And let's look at what happened in the US. Um, as you well know, the US higher education is funded in a completely different way. It's, it's private funded, it's not public funded. Uh, I was on the board of the Tufts University, which is one of the three big ones in, 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 in the US. And the president of Tufts used to always tell me on Monday morning when we had our trust board meeting, you know, this week I'm 10 million short and I need to see where I find the next 10 million to fund the university. A completely different attitude than we have here in Switzerland. And what has been created in the US is an endowment structure which supports the funding of the universities. And you can see here the asset allocation of the endowment funds over the last 50 to 60 years with the growing venture capital finance funding industry in the United States. A significant part of the asset allocation in the endowment industry in the US is in fact um, alternative assets and a significant part of that has been invested in venture capital. And let me read an article which was um, issued a couple of uh, days ago. The headline says, Harvard's endowment source to 53.2 billion reports 33.6% returns. The Harvard Management Company, which is the company that runs the fund, returned 36.6% on investments for the fiscal year ending in June 2021. Under the new management, Harvard has, over the decades, dramatically reduced its assets in natural resources, real estate markets, and public equity, while increasing its exposure to hedge funds, private equity, and in particular, venture capital. Now, this is a cr quite a remarkable article, 33.6% on a narrow pond. Now, the most remarkable part of this article, I have not read yet. However, Harvard's returns have continually lagged behind its peers 
in the Ivy League, a trend that appeared to continue this past fiscal year. Of the schools that have announced their endowment returns, Dartmouth College reported 47%, while the University of Pennsylvania reported 41% of returns. I think you can see this dramatic switch in asset allocation, which the endowment industry has done in the US, and has returned dramatic returns for their universities and for high school returns, completely unmatched to what we are seeing here in Europe. The venture capital um, industry, of course, is looking for unicorns uh, because these unicorns are, in essence, funding all of these investments which don't work. I have taken out a few numbers which are quite interesting. We have about 500 unicorns at the moment worldwide. 75% of these unicorns are either US or China based. 25 of these unicorns make up 90% of the market capitalization. Mm -hmm. This is in contrast to the fact that in Europe, including Switzerland, we have had in the years 2009 to 2019, 36% of all startups created worldwide, but only 14% 40% of the unicorn. Why that's the case? The simple answer is the venture capital industry in the United States has significantly more funds to scale up these ventures to the level of the unicorns. So this is not simply a question of luck or bad luck, so not, it is di directly linked to the determination of investments which goes into this industry. And that's why we are lacking here dramatically in Switzerland and also in Europe. What do you think? How many unicorns do we have in Switzerland? Depending on how you count, maybe four, maybe five, I would say four. Two of them, are, by the way, from Basel. <laughs> <laughs> now, of course, the argument is uh, the, US has, uh, the US has enormous capability in terms of uh, funds, size, everything and of course size matters and the US is a big economy but as you can see on this chart we are I'm trying to, to compare us with smaller countries one of them being Israel Israel is around in terms of GDP a little bit more than half of Switzerland their pension fund industry is about 60 percent of uh, their uh, uh, their GDP Despite all of that, you can see the percentage on the right hand of investments they are doing in venture capital. You mentioned it, we have a trillion of funds available in the Swiss pension fund, 130%, 130% of Swiss GDP. If we would fund a similar percentage of Israel is doing currently in venture capital, we would be in the range of 45 or 50 billion, which is a significant multiple of what we have available currently in the venture capital industry in Switzerland. So the upside is quite dramatic. And as was mentioned before, all of the large big tech companies today are venture capital financed. This is a um, the chart was proposed by Christian, who is a colleague of mine at the Chris, of the fund. Christian Dreyer, many of you will know him. And we have also Max uh, Gortner, who is also from the uh, foundation here with among us. Um, why this chart? This is uh, one of the, my favorite uh, movies, by the way, uh, Back to the Future. Awesome. We always think, you know, how the future will look like it, and we are guessing how the future will be like it. But the charts I showed to you, and also the advent of the venture capital industry in the United States <coughs> shows you, all of these trends will come to Switzerland as well. And all of these trends will have an impact, and will have to have an impact on our industry as well. It's just a question of time. I mean, imagine other trends like passive investments. It was a trend started in the US, and it is something which came into Switzerland as well. So also this venture capital industry development we have seen over the last 
50 years in the US will come and is coming also to uh, Europe and also to Switzerland. Um, the funny part about this, and we had a little chat about this with Christian, the funny part about this chart is, uh, I don't know whether, whether you remember how this little thing here is called. This is the flux compensator. This is where you make the anything in and then you have the energy to travel in time. I am almost convinced that if the flux compensator would exist, <laughs> it would have been invented in Europe and not in the US. <laughs> but it's the US who commercialized the idea, in this case in the form of a movie. Let's look at Switzerland. This is the asset allocation uh, of the pension funds in Switzerland. Um, I am not quite sure <laughs> um, whether I can uh, uh, take anything out than a quite a sobering <laughs> statement. Something is moving a little bit, uh, but not much. Um, there's no doubt about it that uh, there are restrictions um, which we have to overcome. Some of them are institutionally, maybe political. I think a significant part of the blockage may be in the head. Um, and I definitely believe that this is something which we have to dramatically change over the years to come because it is our money which serves the purpose of ensuring the um, wealth of this nation going forward uh, for the decades and the generations to come. And if we are not using these funds for that purpose, I am not quite sure what we use these funds for um, to earn 3% uh, returns. And if I look at my pension fund uh, um, 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 extract every year, it is quite sobering how much I get out of it. Um, I would like to have a better return on that. Now, the industry in Switzerland has developed substantially. So that's not the case that nothing is happening. We have a substantial increase in capital available in Switzerland over the years. We have now reached 3.1 billion uh, investment in startups in 2021. Mm -hmm. That's the good news. The next slide is the bad news. Almost 90% <laughs> is foreign based investment, which means that any future icon which will derive out of these uh, investments will not necessarily be benefit, uh, you know, the Swiss economy and our wealth, but other people will reap the benefits out of that. And this is something which I think dramatically has to change and we can only change that by substantially increase the funds available to invest in this sector in Switzerland. Now, you mentioned it before, I have a few other heads than uh, um, being the chair of this foundation. I'm also president of Basel Area, which is an, org an agency organization founded by the three cantons in the northwest um, about creating innovation cluster um, and also doing investment settlements in Switzerland. And we have, over the last 15, 20 years, I think, created quite a substantial ecosystem, of course, focused mainly in the life science era. Uh, we have also a successful uh, uh, Swiss innovation park, Bars Area Running, which comes out of a political initiative initiated uh, initially by Ruedi Noso. And we have, of course, a quite substantial allocation of, uh, uh, of startups. Switzerland, I think, has quite a remarkable network of startups coming from the ETH and also coming out from uh, the Geneva area and the AFPFL. And uh, some of our analysis shows that the startups coming from the ETH tend to have a much longer shelf life than some other uh, startups. So that shows that their technology seems to be superior in many cases. Um, we believe that there is substantial amount of talent there's substantial amount of innovative activities and clusters in Switzerland to create the next decades of icons. I think what is missing is a significant investment of funds in Switzerland. And I think there is a correlation in terms of success and returns 
with the amount of input of capital which you put into the system into terms of startup <coughs> scale-up financing in particular. We are not too bad when it comes to small ticket investments for startups. Where I think we are challenging um, our startups is when they are trying to find funds for the growth phase and where you come uh, the big tickets. So having said that, that's in essence I think some of the points I wanted to make to introduce the panel and with that I uh, would like to thank you for having me here. Again, quite a different audience I speak usually to. Um, they're all more finance guys than I am. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Domenico. Uh, I think it's about financing today. It's not uniquely about financing, but I'm very glad. Shall I? Um, Shall I move on? Yeah, yeah, that's that's uh, that's a good idea, though. Not too much, not too long. So I thought I would start like that. You know, we were talking about startups, the importance of startups for the economy, and so forth, and then financing. Um, Switzerland is said to be a startup nation now, right? Um, and we've seen that. You show that, that financing actually, uh, VC capital has been increasing quite much. But isn't that happening globally? I mean, what, what would you say, Andreas, about that? Is Switzerland a startup nation or is this just, you know, part of a, a global tide that is, and we're just uh, moving a little bit with the tide? Yes, we, we see very similar trends all over the globe, at least all over Europe, certainly. Um, to give you an idea, we <clears throat> just with our fund made our first investment in Greece, our first investment in Italy last year and so on. These used to be countries that had almost no startup ecosystem and now you see this developing all over the place. I think Switzerland still has an advantage. We obviously have, a, a, as you explained, a very strong innovation uh, ecosystem. We have amazing universities. We have plenty of money. But uh, I don't think we necessarily have that much of a head start anymore against uh, other European countries, and that's definitely something where we have to catch up. Okay. Um, <clears throat> then what is the start state of affairs of, uh, of financing? We've seen now, you've showed us, 86% comes from abroad. But, you know, isn't is this, is this normal? I mean, the, the venture capital business is, uh, the startup business is an international business. I mean, Andreas, are you only investing in Switzerland or where? And you can't survive as a serious VC firm if you only invest in one country, especially not in a small one like Switzerland. That's completely impossible. So we don't care where in Europe a startup is. We care if it's a good fit, if it's a great team, if it's a great product and so on. And geography plays less and less uh, of a role. And uh, th the same applies also for growth financing. So it's absolutely true that we have a lack of that in Switzerland. To be honest, when my companies want to raise a Series A or B in above 10 million, they don't even talk to Swiss venture capitalists anymore because there's not enough here. And it's not just a lack of money, it's also a lack of expertise that you can get from international VCs. I mean, to give you an example, one of my companies, a small software company called Lecce here in Zurich, uh, <clears throat> a few months ago raised a Series A from Sequoia Capital out of Silicon Valley, one of the top VC funds. And um, this was great, first uh, investment of Sequoia in Switzerland, so they are very interested in this ecosystem. And what we couldn't believe was what level of expertise they bring to the table. So Lecce's technical advisor is now the guy who ran e uh, engineering at Google. The product advisor is now the guy who ran product strategy at Facebook. People like that don't exist in Switzerland. So if you are a really, really ambitious startup, you have to go to international venture capitalists. On the other hand, uh, I think we have great investors here as well who have a high impact for international startups, so it's, it's going to get more and more international all the time. I might challenge that actually, that those people don't exist in Switzerland. I think uh, what the VC funds in, in the US do very well is partner with industry. That's why they dare. They dare to invest because they know they have an end exit partner, I think often. So I think the problem here is that we're not matching that. We're not matching industry, a Lafarge Holt team or large companies that could eventually take over a startup, you know, and create the kind of exit path with VC investors. And, and so that expertise is there, but I think it's not tapped in the right way. So part of the problem is, um our problem is really financing um, from outside and, and actually the, the pipeline. The pipeline leads to different countries. So that was one of the, the questions. Uh, so, you know, I, I also wonder, we have a billion. That was one of your, that's your main theme. There is a trillion, trillion excuse me, 
a trillion, a billion, billion, a trillion Swiss francs uh, out there uh, being invested totally differently. Um, um, Matthias, you, you manage some pension funds. Yes. What's the interest? I mean, the, the empirical interest. I mean, you can look at the, the uh, asset allocation in their portfolios. There's not much there. But maybe something's going on. Is there some interest coming up? Uh, I would say not a lot. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I've been 10 years with Suva, one of the biggest institutional investors in Switzerland. They don't invest in venture capital. And many pension funds also don't, or most of them. The question is why. And I think one answer is very simple. It is not, has not been needed in the last 10, 15 years to have venture capital. I mean, basically every investment went up. Mm -hmm. Swiss bonds went up. Real estate went even more up public equity went up, and if you could manage to have some funds in your portfolio, Facebook and Amazon and Microsoft, you made it. I mean, there was no, it's, it's no necessary to take additional risk. And if I look in, in, in our bank, the different uh, client segments, like pension funds, they are not interested. The, the wealthy families, maybe a little bit. Who is interested is entrepreneurs. And the difference between an entrepreneur and a pension fund is the, the, the entrepreneur is used to take risks. He's a risk taker. The pension fund is not a risk taker. And that's why he, he doesn't make it. Hmm? The, the entrepreneur also likes to have fun with investing. Uh, and venture capital investing is definitely much more fun than buying Swiss bonds or Swiss real estate. Yeah? And, and, that's a, and, and that's the reason why some do, do and some don't. But I think if we look forward where we stand in the markets, the valuation, the interest rates, the, the growth outlooks, I think in the future also pension funds in order to make performance have to go beyond the traditional markets. And that's why I think it's important for them also to look at it. But the problem is they're not incentivized to, to do it, and the regulation is, is, is against them. Hmm? The regulation is the moment the funding rate goes down, they have to sell. They cannot be counter-cyclical investors, and this is a big thing against the venture capital for pension funds. So, now, this is politics, right? Yes. Because it's, it's, if it's about regulation that uh, pension funds are not, not investing into venture capital, um, well, then we would have to think about that. I thought also, yeah, fun. I think we have a, a few members of, board, of the board of trustees. They're not, not fun people. I don't <laughs> Anyway, that's pretty fun. <laughs> we don't like to have fun, right? Anyway, so I thought, how is the mood in parliament about startups on the one hand and pension funds going into that kind of, into that asset class? Well, uh, I think uh, th that's too totally different questions. Startups okay. are very popular in Parliament. Everybody is starling, so to speak. Mm -hmm. um, but when it comes to specific measures that would benefit uh, these startups, then it's uh, pretty much over, <laughs> um, <clears throat> with uh, majorities at least, because it, it would be about creating an environment where they can grow and, and develop, uh, as mentioned by uh, Domenico Scala and uh, others. But uh, I, I would like to get back to that notion of fun, if I may. And I, I would uh, rather address it as a lack of incentives uh, from the side of pension funds, because they have actually, there is a, a pretty much a focus on a risk perspective, uh, if you want. And uh, for, for a uh, pension fund manager, excuse me if I'm uh, just generalizing, I'm sure there are lots of um, exceptions that prove my um, uh, hypothesis. But uh, they, they, first of all, don't want to make mistakes. They have to, uh, to feed the expectations of, of the employees that are insured, and it's good enough to be with the peers. If they have an overperformance, that might be great for themselves. Personally, they may, may have fun not administering uh, um, uh, just uh, boring old stuff. Uh, but at the end of the day, it, 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 there's no real reward for them systemat systemically, I would uh, say. <clears throat> And on the other hand, it's, um, so it's a pity actually from a 
employee perspective that these, these incentives are as they are. But there is a problem <coughs> in, uh, in the knowledge, in the level of knowledge uh, from, from employees as well as from politicians, to be honest, because that's the answer to your second question. Uh, in, in Parliament, the, the asset allocation in pension funds is basically no issue. I never was aware of a discussion about this or that. The, the, you mentioned that mo motion of Mr. Graber. Of course, somebody wants to attribute money to this or to that. Once it's ESG, once it's startups, once it's, uh, it's another idea. Uh, but at the end of the day, my uh, uh, personal and very liberal view is that the regulator should not decide where money flows, but actually investors should, uh, should uh, decide. And uh, that brings me to the last <coughs> point. Um, I think from a startup view, for, for uh, um, people that want to uh, scale up their, uh, their startup, it would be uh, very important to have smart money. And there also, it's uh, pro probably more about the right structure uh, um, with respect to investments in this area uh, than doing it uh, uh, themselves. I, I wouldn't trust uh, my pension fund to do direct investments, but I think it would make a, lo a lot of sense to attribute uh, lots of assets in, in that uh, class. And therefore, we need the structures, we need advisors that are smart enough to, to identify uh, good opportunities. And then it's, uh, in my uh, uh, opinion it's uh, the best way to do it without politics just to leave markets um, a function and and probably to to create incentives to to those who who decide on investments to to really create overperformance and not to focus on risks and to prevent downsides uh, but uh, rather kind of uh, uh, developing an aspiration to to have a nice overperformance as it was presented Okay, and overperformance, um, at least Domenico told us, overperformance we have. And w w what, is, what about really this performance? Is this really over a long term? Does it correlate? I mean, in a portfolio, it's always important. How does it correlate with other, other asset classes? I wonder, uh, start, I mean, basically, the, the huge growth, the multiplication of, uh, of the value of a company comes in the end from innovation. Is startup innovation, is startup investing the right thing? Maybe, Evelyn, we could invest differently into innovation. I mean, are we just kind of too focused on, on, on ventures? Uh, because it's the darling, probably not only in, uh, of, of politics, but also of, of me, mm -hmm. <laughs> possibly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, uh, to answer to that, I mean, I'll, I'll address uh, the, the few things that were said before as well. I spoke to uh, the VC funds that were connected to Backbone and Spice House, and they invest in Swiss and, and German startups. And they told me that over the last 10 years, actually, the top quartile of VC funds have performed in over 10 years annually between 15 and 27% return, okay. right? Amazing. Yeah. So, but that, the other three quartiles have performed really badly. And the S&P is somewhere in between at 9% annualized returns, right? Mm -hmm. So yes, if you have a 10 year horizon and you're good at selecting not those startups, but really those VC funds that have that expertise and you work with them, then you can, can create those kind of returns, right? So, I mean, I was surprised, actually, I didn't know this. Uh, I, I talked to, to these VC funds uh, the last week to prepare for this. So, you know, definitely, I think the solution is to not go around trying to select these startups, but to work with VC funds. And, you know, you just mentioned this before, that these Yale or other endowment funds and Harvard funds have been doing really well. The problem, we can't just tell pension fund managers and a system that hasn't been used to doing this or hasn't done it at all to all of a sudden do it. That's dangerous, right? But how about maybe an idea that just came to me, why don't we hire a few of those people from those other endowment funds? It doesn't have to be a Swiss person helping us out, right? Can, can we get them over? Can we help them? Can we get them over to help us understand VC investing a little bit better? So the, that's just to that, maybe an idea. Um, I'm speaking my own book now on the second part of the question, sure. which is uh, we obviously believe that 
uh, you can create innovation linked returns with, with listed equities still very well in a kind of a private equity like way, if you will, if you focus on innovation revenues. And actually, we do try to find out how to identify innovation as it creates value through working with entrepreneurs, so working with startups. And not, they're not only based in Switzerland, they're basically globally. But I think we need to continue this dialogue with, with entrepreneurs, because they are the ones that are moving new technologies into larger companies and into economies. Um, it's just a, a different way to create that value can also be seen in, in the listed equity space, I think, still. I mean, I think in a portfolio perspective, I think it's uh, important to find a mix of investing in innovators mm -hmm. and on the other side, investing in company sectors, countries where they use the innovation. Mm -hmm. And there is also a lot of potential. And for example, artificial intelligence. So these codes are around, they are, they are found out. But it's very interesting, for example, in retail to invest in those companies which now really get these efficiency gains out of artificial intelligence, or for example, a, comp a country like India, the use of mobile phones and banking with mobile, this has huge impact. So I think in a portfolio, you have to find the balance between both. Thank you. I, you I mentioned, mean, yeah, sure. You know, I mean, the future, the, the foundation does not promote direct investments in venture capital yeah. by uh, individual pension funds. I think even the large pension funds simply may not have the capabilities. So this is a question of delegation, and therefore you have to go through uh, the industry and attract the best people. Um, now, the delegation can happen through a, a fund, a fund of fund, or th through a form of cooperation among pension funds. We also don't believe that this should be mandatory uh, by no means, because that's counterproductive. Uh, the regulator, I think, should enable it as far as he can without being uh, uh, um, directive about that. Uh, but, you know, it, it, it sounds a little bit the presentation I saw on the infrastructure fund before. Uh, nobody is taking the effort to start with uh, the construction phase. <laughs> Everybody wants to start to invest when the thing is up and running again. So the question is how we overcome that initial construction phase of creating something which serves the purpose of getting these funds directed where we want to that in the, in the sense of Switzerland, you see? And that's where I think we are struggling also as a foundation board uh, to get that initial piece done. The second one may be the easiest piece of the puzzle because if you have success, br success breeds, of course, more success and you attract more funds. But the construction part of the first piece is where we are struggling. So maybe then the incentive structure that we could build is, a, is that what you mentioned, the consortium building, right? Because you, know, you mentioned that the success of ETL-based startups might be based on the better technology at ETH. I would say it's based on better funding that ETH-based startups get, right? So if you can make a consortium of pension funds see that them investing in this project makes the project more viable, you know, that might be an incentive structure in a way that you can have that isn't politically imposed, right? Uh, I don't know how we can create that, though. That's up to you guys then. <laughs> Maybe you want to comment on that? Well, that sounds very interesting to me. I mean, uh, no one, um, it's not forbidden to, to do that. Mm. I mean, you, you could go and start tomorrow if you find the partners that are interested in doing so. And the, the other uh, issue that comes to my mind is, for example, the the so-called legal quote uh, in uh, con attributing the, the overperformance of, um, of asset management in uh, Vollversicherung, mm -hmm. which is legally defined by 9010, mm -hmm. which uh, is basically a, a, a kind of asks uh, insurers to, to invest um, conservatively and, and not uh, taking any unnecessary risk because it, it simply it's not worth uh, the hassle. <laughs> if I may so, say so, and that leads to, to uh, moderate performance and for sure does not uh, create any pressure or, or uh, in, enhance uh, innovation and, and investments into startup environment. I also have a, I mean, there's this anecdotal uh, evidence that in Switzerland, um, 
investors only want to invest into a young company when there are already revenues. So is it about liquidity? Because I, uh, is it the problem that there's, it's, you know, the cash flow is not coming, it's a problem of liquidity because it's, especially if you're in biotechnology, it takes a long time uh, for, for revenues to come in. So many things you have to do. But you mentioned Yale and other endowments. I mean, Yale is a university. They have to cover liquidity every year. And actually, I think it's the foundation finances most of the school, of the university. It's not, not the tuition fees, which are ho horrendous as well. But, and and they, they invest heavily into it. So is liquidity a problem, Matthias? Is that something that is brought up when you talk to, uh, to pension funds? I mean, liquidity, of course, is, is then a, a problem when the markets are going down and the fund funding ratios below 100, uh, then the, the, the pension fund have to, have to react because then the illiquid part is, is increasing. So they need a proper asset liability management. They, have, they need the professionalism to, to manage this and not every pension fund has this, so they, they avoid that. I, th I think yeah. it's, by the way, uh, another point that speaks towards um, having these um, aggregates where several funds collaborate to build a portfolio of venture funds. Because what, what we often hear in our uh, fundraising when we go to pension funds is a complete misunderstanding of uh, how venture capital works. They sometimes tell us, oh, you know, we're going to invest a little bit of money in this one VC fund and see how it goes, right? And then maybe five years after we decide that we want to be in this asset class. It's like saying, oh, I want to go in the stock market and put uh, money in one company and see if equities are for us, right? That's not how it works. You have to have a portfolio of VC funds, what you mentioned earlier, that uh, <clears throat> there are outliers who drive all the returns. And if you can't do that, and realistically, almost all pension funds, I would claim, in Switzerland can't do that in terms of size, expertise, timelines, and so on, then you are not going to be successful in investing this asset class. So the, the big endowments in the US, they have portfolios of hundreds of thousands of different VC funds and manage this in a, in a very focused way, and th that's the best way to do it. Okay, that. Which is why we have to overcome somehow that inif initial phase mm. of finding a, a, either a vehicle or a cooperative form among these pension funds to allocate jointly funds uh, uh, into this uh, investment class. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Actually, I think, and uh, we've talked about this uh, pension funds, maybe, you know, Every one of you has a pension fund, mm -hmm. compulsory in Switzerland. So I would like to ask the, um, the audience, uh, would, you want, would you want, well, perhaps we're, we're uh, slightly biased probably, but I'm going to ask you all the, <laughs> all the same because you're in the alternative investment forum now. But anyway, would you want, would you want your pension fund to invest uh, into, into ventures or venture, venture funds or funds of funds? Or would you rather have DeFi? Four percent. Four percent. How much? How much? Long? <laughs> yeah, that's, a, yeah, that's pretty good. That's pretty good. DeFi? <laughs> Not sure. Uh. <laughs> Depends on the... Qu okay, not too much, of course. Depends. Is there a... Okay. Actually, to actually do those investments as well. So I think if you want to say yes, you want to allocate to to like a VC or something else, but do you have the people that can actually do that you know, in a successful way? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I would and agree. This. I mean, the difference of capabilities of venture capitalists from one fund to the other can be remarkably different. Yeah. Yeah. So I think uh, I'm I'm not a venture capitalist. I wouldn't uh, make a call. But the quality of the people is absolutely critical. There's no doubt about that. Yeah, that's actually another question. The quality of the people. I mean, ETH was, fun, was founded by Alfred Escher because he thought two things, actually. He thought uh, well, it was financing. That was Credit Suisse. They did touch that at the time. But he also thought about the quality of people. We need engineers, people like Evelyn. Um, do we have the quality of people here? Maybe Andreas, also Evelyn. Or actually, Beat. No, um, politicians are different category. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> we, have the no be quality. we have the best politicians. <laughs> <laughs> like, uh, I mean, opinion it, on that. <laughs> okay. 
the quality of people in the startup world, I think, uh, on the technical side, absolutely 100% yes. I think ETH, EPFL are absolute top world class. So we hear this all the time from international investors as well. They really want to see this. Where we really, really struggle, and it's extremely frustrating for us as an early stage VC, is in bringing together the engineering talent with the commercial talent. We have still ETH teams who come to us and say, oh, you know, our technology is so amazing, everybody wants to buy it anyway, probably, and uh, we'll hire some random sales guy two years from now, maybe, uh, to do all the paperwork. <laughs> That's just okay. not how it works. I mean, um, when you talk uh, to people at MIT or other U uh, top US universities, they are aware that they have to, from the very beginning, work with commercial talent and that's still a huge struggle and one of the terrible things here on the axis between Zurich and St. Gallen is that we have two world-class universities, one for the technical stuff, one for the commercial stuff and they never talk to each other. It's crazy. And, and I keep telling that uh, both sides that they maybe should figure out how to co cooperate and they won't do it. So one of my companies uh, has a founding team uh, out of a HSG guy and an ETH guy. Amazing team. They just got um, a term sheet from a Silicon Valley fund. They are pre-revenue and got a 50 million valuation. Turnaround time from first uh, talk to term sheet 48 hours. So that's the reality in today's market. I mean, which by the way is also speaks to should pension funds uh, invest directly in startups. If you feel you can do this in 48 hours, <laughs> sure, um, probably not. But. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, all the data you can you can uh, refer to shows that Europe and Switzerland is enormously inventive, innovative. Um, patterns a lot of technologies, but when it comes to commercialization, the US beats us all. <laughs> uh, also financing, that's what I got from, from our financing. discussion. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I guess I'll... Yeah, I, I think let's wrap up, it up at this problem. stage. <laughs> I think we, we are wonderfully in time and we can, can slap, like, gradually switch into the next panel. But I, <laughs> Bert is still with you, I'm not... Taking the oh, absolutely no. I know I'm. Time is up now. So no, it's good. Not up now, but but I I thought we haven't heard very much from from the audience up to now. I know that there are actually trustee board members uh, here. Uh, and um, yeah, maybe one one two questions, questions from you for so that we can and and for the other uh, um, panel members or from the virtual from, reality. From the virtual reality. There is a question. Oh, there is one. Oh, yeah. super. Mr. Schott. Thank you. Um, yeah, kind of an open, open question to the panel. Uh, we had the comparison between DeFi uh, and uh, VC, uh, and I was wanting to open the question up. If um, you know, DeFi becomes a thing, and I think it might, it might very well, who will be there to you know to find it, and who will be there to grow it? Will it be the VC um, kind of area, or is are these going to be large corporates that we already know, um, usually U.S. corporates? A VC that understands it. <laughs> <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> <laughs> it's not going to be me. <laughs> Maybe it's not completely different. Maybe it's it's not the either or, right? Maybe it's VC and DeFi. Matter of portfolio, maybe, Matthias, I don't know what, I mean... Yeah, I mean, I, I think, in general, I think these DeFi business models is very similar than these venture capital firms. Huh? They are very early stage, and a few work, and most of them don't. I mean, the difference in these, in these DeFi business models is they don't need a lot of investing, of capital, huh? because these are, these are a couple of coders who set up a code and let it run, and if it's uh, successful, it works. I think it's a big, big difference. Mm. Yeah, I think, I mean, I'll, I'll add to that, uh, that, I mean, the problem in the end of the day is, is that we heard this before, right? People don't want to invest in what they think they don't understand. And so we get back to this, uh, you know, the US is more commercial or whatever. They just talk more in general. They talk more to each other, with each other, against each other and everything. And I think we have those connoisseurs. We have those startups that build these DeFi businesses that actually do work, you know, and then there's those that don't. And we have people that understand it. And there some, seems to be a lack of communication between these different entities. And that's what doesn't give and then an, an incentive structure that has brought people to make decisions at pension funds 
that didn't have to make that decision, do I want to invest in what VC, right? So, I mean, once we give people, I think, this feeling of understanding through collaborating, maybe we can create that system, but it's not going to be from, from today to tomorrow. We have to, we have to work on that. We have to work on that. I think that's a, a perfect, uh, perfect cue to go on to the next, uh, next discussion. And actually, we're talking about incentives so much. And the next panel is going to be about pension fund reform. We've heard now from several of you um, yeah, that the incentives are just, aren't just, just aren't conducive uh, for the pension funds to, to go too much into that. But I'd first like to thank you very much. Uh, for, your, for your contribution today, and I hope that you stay on, um, because the next theme is about pension fund reform. Some of you, I, meant, I realized during the discussion that everyone has something to say here about that, and actually that's good, because every one of us has a pension fund, and uh, we should all be involved. So please give him a hand. It's a wonderful, wonderful super panel. Thank you. Thanks a million.